Hi, everyone. I'm Peter Gianetti, Editor-in-Chief of Homepage News, and welcome to the opening session of a special two-part series examining findings of the first annual Homepage News Consumer Outlook Survey. I'm joined today by Liana Salama, Vice President of Marketing for the International Housewares Association. Homepage News and IHA have collaborated on proprietary market research and analysis to help the home and housewares business understand and adapt to swings in consumer purchase influence while identifying new growth paths. The first annual Homepage News Consumer Outlook Survey commissioned by IHA assessed key consumer purchase intent factors for housewares from a nationally projectable online poll by Morning Consult of some 4,000 prospective home product shoppers heading into 2022. The Homepage News 2022 Consumer Outlook Report, which is presented exclusively on homepagenews.com, provides detailed charts and analytics, serving up revealing insights on preferred products, key price points, key retail channels, key product attributes, and more in 15 core housewares categories. It's an illuminating on-demand tool that can help bring precision to strategic home product and marketing development as consumers recalibrate lifestyles and shopping preferences for a post-pandemic era. For this special webinar series, we're organizing findings from the 15 Outlook survey categories into four consumer lifestyle themes, home cooking, dining and entertaining, home I'm sorry, health, comfort, and beauty, and clean living. In today's first session, we'll examine home cooking and dining and entertaining. And we'll be back next Tuesday, May 10th, with highlights from health, comfort, and beauty, and clean living. But let's start first with the big picture. Purchase intent is strong across all of the core categories surveyed in the Outlook survey. Uh, from, from what we can see, the, the, the lowest category purchase intent is home environment at 40%. It goes all the way up to almost 70% in categories like personal care and wellness and, um, and, clean, and cleaning tools. These are all categories, as you can tell, that kind of saw a surge during the pandemic. What we're seeing here is that surge. In spite of that surge, there's a lot of runway uh, for the home and housewares business across the spectrum of the categories. And the Outlook survey kind of uh, validates that. We'll take a look at some of the details in that finding, those findings as we go forward. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Liana Salama, who's gonna provide some of the macro market factors that provide critical context for the first annual Consumer Outlook survey and its findings. Welcome, Liana. Thanks so much, Peter. So one thing, um, one thing I wanted to start with here is just talking a little bit about some of the findings we pulled out of a separate study that IHA did called the IHA Market Watch. Um, that report will be released in the next couple of weeks here, um, and it focuses on three different types of consumers or consumer value sets. One being consciousness, one being creativity, and one being connectivity. Uh, this is not the presentation where I'm going to go into any of those, but that just gives you some context for a couple of the uh, findings you'll see here. And all of this is proprietary research as well. Um, but on the creativity side, one of the things that we attribute to the creative consumer is this desire for new skill acquisition. And it's no secret to anybody you know, that, that cooking and baking has, you know, really picked up over the last couple of years during the pandemic as consumers were home, as consumers were finding ways to spend their time and ways to feed their family in absence of some of their normal options. But what's really interesting here, if you look at the skill of cooking and baking on the first line here, you see that about 32% of consumers said that they picked that up as a new skill in 2021. But then you see that another 21% of consumers intend to pick it up as a new skill in 2022. So so even as we're seeing the pandemic start to maybe roll back or alleviate just a little bit here and people start to come out and get back to their normal day-to-day -day lives, um, the notion of cooking and baking as a skill that people want to have in their homes, want to bring out uh, for friends and family continues to be very, very strong. So when we look at the home cooking category, if you will, you know, macro, um, macro group here, it's really broken into six different categories. So kitchen electrics, bakeware, cookware, kitchen tools and gadgets, 
cutlery and kitchen textiles. And, you know, as Peter mentioned, there's strong purchase intent across the board for all of these things, between 50% and nearly 60% for a few of them here. But what's really interesting is that if you dig into the data and start to look at it on a generational divide, what you find is that millennials actually um, disproportionately intend to buy across all of these categories. So the you know, extrapolation from that, of course, is that millennials are the ones who are really continuing to push the bringing of these new skills into their households. By about 10% in any given category, millennials are more likely to have purchase intent than the, than the average of all adults. Well, it's interesting, Liana, and, and I think the, the market's been talking about millennials for so long now, they, they don't realize the millennials, the, the, the early millennials are actually in their 40s right now. And, and, uh, and what we're seeing is uh, it's just an affirmation of the fact that uh, this generation is not just starting their homes, but they're kind of immersed into building those, those homes, starting families and all the values that sort of uh, were, were, were raised during the pandemic are very, very high when it comes to cooking uh, with that demographic. And now we see Gen Z kind of coming up uh, and, and bringing a lot of that sort of motivation to cook at home uh, with that as well, too. No, totally agree. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each one of these six categories and do a slightly deeper dive on them in terms of what types of products make up these purchase intents and what types of uh, retail channels and attributes are consumers looking for related to each category. I'll kick it back over to Peter to start with kitchen electrics here. Yeah, kitchen electrics is obviously a very important category. Um, this, there's a list here of, of, of how wide the scope of purchase intent is in, uh, in, in the kitchen electrics business. What's interesting here is the number one item is air fryers. And this has been a top item for many, many years and it continues to be a top item. But you see, as you start going through the list, toasters, blenders, uh, you're seeing kind of the mix of lifestyles that are, that are evident in, in purchase intent, toasters. We've heard all about breakfast being a more important meal than ever. That continues. Blenders, health and fitness, uh, entertaining. Um, so there is a, a, a wide demand. You're going to see coffee continue to show strong. And what's interesting here is drip coffee makers are slightly more preferred as a purchase preference right now than single serve, which tells you that the consumers are, are having multiple multiple coffee makers in their home and drip coffee makers still is a predominant product, especially when you're serving more people. Um, when we look at some of the notable retail channels and let me back up a little bit, uh, department and discount stores, uh, not surprisingly, were strong across all the categories and online was another strong category. We, we're looking uh, at around 18 to 19% consistently. Uh, we're looking at uh, channels that showed up that sort of underscore uh, uh, opportunity that might still be untapped in this business. So we see things like warehouse clubs showing strong in the kitchen elect electrics business. Uh, when we look at certain things among this consumer base uh, in terms of product preferences, finish and color is an important consideration in this category. Stainless steel, by far the number one choice. It's simple, it's classic, it's versatile, but we do see black and white, which are standards for a long time, showing strong. Although there's, and there's a little bit of color to match kitchen accents at 13%. So it's a bit across the board, but, but not surprisingly, stainless steel, uh, it's clean, it's simple, it's elegant, it's versatile, shows up strong. Leon, I know you might have some other uh, insights here on kitchen electrics. Yeah, one of the things I really like to do when we get the research back is to go through all the cross tabs and identify interesting trends by generational divide. And, you know, specifically for kitchen electrics, we asked a couple of questions related to certain attributes that would, um, would encourage consumers to spend more. I think the specific question was, would you pay $10 more for a kitchen electric that was? Um, and two, again, these are going to be millennials call outs here, but I think they're very interesting. Um, one having to do with, would you be paying more for a kitchen electric that has a celebrity chef endorsement attached to it? 42% uh, of all adults would be willing to pay more. 57% of millennials would be willing to pay more for that celebrity chef endorsement. And the other thing I, in, I think is interesting, and partially because I saw so much of this emerging at the show this year, is whether or not consumers would be willing to pay more for a kitchen electric with a retractable cord. 63% of adults would be willing to pay more for that and 71% of millennials. So those of you who are um, working on pushing out electrics with retractable cords, you guys are right on the money with that, that effort there. 
And there's a question from someone in our audience about toaster ovens missing from this chart. It's not among these um, that showed up in the, in the answers, but if I can, I'll look, I'll look at that later and see if we can um, uh, get that information for you. Yeah, we may be able to, able to extrapolate that from yep. the toaster category. Mm -hmm. We move on to bake, where uh, Eliana talked earlier about how cooking and baking uh, uh, behaviors and, and uh, are, are just uh, prevalent in, in the marketplace right now. Bakeware is, is a dominant force in the kitchen right now. And we see a lot of information that tells us that's not going to change. It's a family activity. It's a personal activity. Um, you know, we, we look at cookie sheets. Uh, it's, it's a bit of an indulgent activity, too. Uh, we look at cookie sheets being by far the number one choice, but we see uh, preference for products from cake pans to loaf pans to even specialty baking forms. Notably, this is where supermarkets, and you'll see supermarkets showing up in a lot of these categories at 10% or more. The consumer has an expectation to find these food-related and cooking-related products in their supermarket, and they're getting used to seeing better product in supermarkets. That's a theme we're seeing well, when it comes to their price point expectations. Um, more than anything, a, a, a note that stood out here is baking frequency. Uh, when you look at this almost, what do we have, 47% uh, so nearly half uh, of the consumers surveyed are baking at least once a week, and 23% are baking more than one time a week. The need for product to serve that activity is going to be continual going forward. And again, not to, you know, not to beat a dead horse, but if you look at, if you isolate just the millennials in our survey, um, the once a week baking or more jumps up to 62%. So again, really, you know, strong opportunity in that particular area. Yep, very good. Cookware, obviously cookware and bakeware kind of go hand in hand. Um, you know, again, you're, some of these products that you see aren't going to be so surprising to you, but it is important to see that there is a wide preference uh, for cookware, um, individual cookware products. Yes, cookware sets are still at 38% of the market, but we see frying pans at 49% of, of the preference, multi-purpose pans, big market for that, big growth the last couple of years, versatility, oven to table. Uh, saucepans, griddles, loaf pans, even stock pots and woks. There is a preference for individuality in the cookware category. While sets will continue and do continue to have a strong place, we're seeing a lot more consumers mix and match uh, cookware products uh, by different materials, different specialties. They want to have this sort of versatility, excuse the expression, baked into their, their kitchen right now. Uh, among the things we see, notable retail channels, home specialty stores do show strong here. This is another category where, where the warehouse club is uh, an important consideration. Interestingly, warehouse clubs do sell sets, but they're also selling smaller multi-packs right now, sets of fry pans, um, they're giving consumers more options. Uh, we, we hear a lot of talk about nonstick uh, and nonstick, fluoropolymer nonsticks are once again in the news. There are some states considering some regulations with regard to that type of product. Whether it's fluoropolymer, which is con still considered a very safe uh, nonstick, or ceramic or another form of nonstick, the consumer still has a strong preference for nonstick. 51% uh, strongly prefer it, and another almost 20% some are preferred. So the nonstick category is gonna to continue to be an important segment in all its forms. And when you go back to the frying pan preference, that's where nonstick is really very important. When you look at material preference, nonstick aluminum, once again, a prevalent, uh, prevalent category with the consumer, lots of awareness of that category to the consumer, but stainless steel, uh, classic, uh, versatile, uh, it continues to show strength at 26% of consumers picking it. And again, you'll see consumers mixing nonstick aluminum products with stainless steel products with other materials, cast iron, um, uh, even uh, ceramic. There's, there's so many different choices right now, and the consumers are gravitating to that. Yeah, and yeah. one of the things we see too, um, not necessarily in this particular report, but um, but in other uh, things that we've looked at for Market Watch in particular, is um, is the need for things that are dishwasher safe to make it convenient and easy to clean up after meals. So that's just another thing to to keep in mind as you think about the different attributes of cookware that can make one um, one set or one potter pan stand out from the rest is ease of clean, which often includes dishwasher safe. 
kitchen tools and gadgets. This is one of the most diverse categories out there. Uh, there are there are standard products that have been around forever. Can openers continue to show up as a, the uh, the most preferred product, but it, it is a category that gets used just about every day in the home. But as you look through the the list of categories here. Uh, you're going to see things like measuring spoons and cups at a high uh, uh, high percentage. I think there's a tie back to baking there. Uh, as baking is more important, the need for measuring uh, is more important. Um, you see indulgence, I mean, the ice cream scoops. You see the, import, the continuing importance of coffee and tea accessories. And then as you look through the list, you're going to see specialized kitchen tools. Uh, there, there, is a, there is a kitchen tool for just about every specialty right now, whether it's fruit or garlic. Um, uh, graters and zesters, uh, cocktail tools. Uh, it, it, it is a consumer is gravitates to items they feel serve their personal needs in the kitchen and the gadget and kitchen tool business is one of those industries that continues to serve that. I know Liana and I talked yeah. about reusable straws showing up. Uh, yeah, I think that's so public. interesting. I mean, certainly I would expect reusable straws to appear in the list, but for them to be, you know, outweighing things like a garlic tool or like a corkscrew or bottle opener, which are kind of, you know, cost of entry in most kitchens that I partake in, um, you know, seeing that reusable straw category jump up there like that, I think is really encouraging and just further demonstrates, you know, how how much the, the whole notion of sustainability is so much less a trend than it is just a way of life for so many people at this point. And, and the consumer is finding more of those products. They're actually seeing them. They're more aware of them now. And I think that lends to their higher, the higher preference for that category. In the, uh, some of the notable retail channels here, again, home specialty uh, shows strong supermarket, another, it's been an important um, uh, channel for kitchen tools and gadgets for many, many years. I think what's noteworthy here again is sort of the, the, the preference toward better goods in the supermarket channel. And again, this was a little bit surprising to me. Stainless steel, much like in electrics, uh, very high preference. Again, it, I think it's seen as being easy to clean, highly durable, higher quality. Silicone, where we've seen a lot of innovation in the last several years, not nearly as strong a preference as stainless steel, but it is still an important segment in the marketplace and the consumer is very aware of that. Uh, we look at cutlery. Um, I was surprised actually when I saw that knife sets with cutlery blocks were the top preference. Only surprised because we've heard a lot about uh, open stock cutlery in the last uh, few years, but it does tell me that if you're starting a home or if you are uh, looking to up, update uh, your cutlery, the idea of buying a set that has all of the key items in one um, is still important to consumers. Once you get past the set preference though, chef knife, chef knife rules the kitchen in, in the cutlery business. It is the standard against which all other products and cutlery tend to be judged by the consumer. They're, they're going to the chef knife first. We are seeing an influx of, of higher quality, more affordable uh, cutlery products, well-designed cutlery products. And the consumer again is gravitating toward better product. Uh, and then as you go down the, uh, the list, you'll see standard products that have been popular forever, paring knives, carving knives, bread knives. There is again, a neat cheese knives. There is a, a need for these specialty products that the consumer believes perform those functions to their best. Um, uh, again, uh, like with uh, kitchen tools and gadgets, home specialty and supermarket, strong outlets for this uh, business, maybe untapped outlets uh, by the industry when it comes to the better side of the business. Um, forge blade is preferred by 50%. Uh, that tells me the consumers are, many consumers are very aware of forged as the presumably uh, higher quality, longer lasting, uh, higher performing product. Yeah, uh, another, Peter, another quarter of that, 25% um, after that other 50% of the equation, 25% have no preference. Right, so right. there's still opportunity for to, to recapture any of that additional 25%. We, we look at cutting boards here because it's important to understand the cutlery business is, is, is not just about the knives. The cutlery business segues into accessories like sharpeners and cutting boards as an important adjunct to the cutlery business. Um, Hardwood cutting boards, and there's a lot of variety in those uh, right now, continue to be a strong preference. I think consumers see them as somewhat durable and traditional. Uh, they, they are decorative to an extent as well, too. They serve a lot of functions from 
uh, from the counter to the serving table. Uh, and meanwhile, polyplastic cutting boards, which saw a real heyday a few years ago as food safety became an issue, uh, continue to draw a lot of attention from the consumer. Kitchen textiles, this, this is an interesting category because um, I, I'm gonna go backwards. Instead of going over the products first that they, uh, uh, they prefer, I'm gonna start with one of the most interesting findings is that uh, people are changing the look of their kitchen towels frequently during the year. Two to three times a year by 32% of the consumer, four times a year by 19% of the consumer. It tells me that you know from a seasonal standpoint or just the opportunity to update the decor, the kitchen textile category serve multiple purposes. Yes, uh, they're, they're uh, there, there are functional elements to, to kitchen towels. They are relatively inexpensive rel relative to other uh, product categories. So the opportunity to kind of transition consumers in and out of product is uh, pre uh, prevalent. You see home specialty stores here, supermarkets jump up to 19%. Again, a huge opportunity for multiple placement within supermarkets. Uh, it doesn't support Surprise me that dish towels uh, are by far the leading uh, category here. Uh, it gets the most use in the kitchen, and it also was one of the more decorative elements in the kitchen textiles business. But look through here, from pot holders to cleaning cloths to napkins, even placemats and tablecloths, which we may not hear as much about these days, they continue to serve a function and a, uh, a utilitarian and a decorative function in the, uh, in the kitchen. Uh, one of the other findings here I pulled out was we hear a lot about sustainability. Liana uh, addressed that earlier uh, with, with one of the categories. This is one of those categories where eco-friendly materials uh, is very, very important to the consumer. 23% say very important, 38% say somewhat important. And we have seen a lot of innovation in this uh, textile segment when it comes to renewable and uh, eco-friendly materials. The consumer is responding to those as long as they A, work well, and B, look great. So before we move on to dining and entertaining, let's take a look at some of the key takeaways in the home cooking segment. Uh, there's lots of untapped demand for kitchen electrics and kitchenware after unprecedented sales surges during the pandemic. Yes, these categories jumped considerably the last couple of years. There's a lot of runway left. And, and my feeling is the next wave of purchases as we move through 2022 and beyond, these are gonna be consumers looking to step up. They're gonna be looking for innovation and new features to drive that conversion. If they haven't made that purchase yet, they've been holding off for whatever reason, maybe they didn't feel they needed it, but now they wanna buy it and they're gonna be looking at better product as they move forward. Uh, hard to ignore baking is still on the rise. Uh, it, it will continue to, to be a strong factor in the kitchen. Uh, it is a multi-unit product. There's lots of different opportunities to sell the consumer multiple, multiple products in the baking and baking accessory business. Uh, we've talked a lot about the supermarket channel for better cooking products. Don't discount the growth potential there. It will continue to be uh, an important factor. And it is, it is one of those areas where when you talk about brick and mortar, while some of the supermarket chains are getting much better at home delivery, uh, this is a, a channel of distribution that the consumer is in perhaps more frequently, a store more frequently than any other channel. Housewares needs to get in front of them more, more often in that channel. Leanna, why don't, you, why don't you address the millennials here? Sure. I just want to, you know, circle back to the supermarket piece of all of this. You know, I think that um, we've had a lot of conversations with folks in the last couple of years and grocery and supermarket were already doing, you know, some really smart things related to how they're merchandising housewares. Um, but, you know, I go out now and I see, you know, we, we talk about consumers being more and more, not just comfortable, but, you know, looking to their supermarkets and grocery stores for housewares products. And I put a lot, of, I give a lot of credit um, to, the, uh, to the retailers out there who are doing such a great job of cross merchandising and getting all that center aisle stuff out of the damn center aisle and get it out around the different types of food that it's intended to go with because that creates impulse purchase opportunities and you know when people are trying new recipes as they're trying to pick up these new skills um, you know they're going to need some of these new tools and these new uh, these new pieces so I just you know kudos to the the category for doing a nice job of bringing the housewares out into the main areas. 
Um, but to Peter's point, you know, the last note on this slide just related to many to millennials, as I started out with, um, you know, they represent a significantly higher purchase intent across all of these categories, roughly 10% higher than the average of all adults. Um, and that is not, that's not attributable to just the fact that there's more of them or anything else. That is literally like on a one-to-one -one basis, a millennial is 10% more likely to intend to purchase these products than a Gen Xer, than a, you know, than the average adult. Um, Peter, before we move on to dining and entertaining, we do have a couple questions in here. I thought maybe we just sure. cover off on the ones for this section. Um, there's a question related to what year did air fryers first make the kitchen electrics list? And while this is the first time that IHA and Homepage News have produced this survey, certainly there have been other surveys, you know, and reports like it that have been produced in the past. So Peter, I don't know if you have yeah, any recollection. I, I don't know if I can give you the exact year right now. Uh, I've been involved in doing this type of research for almost 30 years right now. And on an aided basis, I know a previous, some previous research that we uh, did, at, I did when I was with Homeworld Business, um, we started adding air fryers to the list of categories about six years ago. Um, once we started seeing some saturation in the market. The, the interesting thing is the category actually kind of rose real fast, but it never slowed down. Uh, and it, it continues to, to, there are other categories and not to, not to malign a category, multi-cookers, for instance, was another category that five, six, seven years ago started to really get into the mainstream of the consumer. Been around for a long time, but thanks to marketing efforts and some developmental efforts, the consumer really gravitated to it. But that category grew real fast and it, then it started to plateau and level off a little bit. Air fryers haven't shown us that yet. Um, I think it's a little bit of this uh, notion that uh, we like to think we're cooking healthier and the air fryer yeah. promises healthy cooking, but the reality of it is people are putting frozen chicken nuggets and french fun. fries and Master. all sorts of good tasting hearty foods. Maybe yeah. they're not so healthy for you, but boy, they're fun to eat. And the air fryer has served that uh, niche. I hear more people talk enthusiastic, my friends and family talk enthusiastically about air fryers than just about any product they have in their home right now. Yeah, I think to your point about multi-cookers, it's interesting to see where that's going to go. Um, you know, coming out of the Inspired Home Show last um, last month, gosh, two months ago now, we're already in May. Um, but the um, one of the things that I saw was a real gravitational um, shift towards multi-cookers that are much simpler and much yeah. more user-friendly. I it almost feels as though we we just started to get overcomplicated as, as we increase the number of things we wanted these multi-cookers to do. We increase the difficulty in user experience and the you know, frustration that consumers could have with that. I saw a number of products at the show this past year that really attempt to you know, put forward the same number of cooking techniques, but do them in a much simplified way, whether that's through you know, an adjacent little tablet that you can just program in, um, you know, any kind of, any way to make it easier on the consumer to make that thing do all the different things it's supposed to do. Multifunction for the sake of multifunction is not good enough for this consumer. Right. Years ago, multifunction was not necessarily a popular concept in the U.S., but in recent years, multifunctionality has really caught on, but the consumer has a high expectation that each of those functions is going to be performing at the highest level. You try to cram too much information into that product and the consumer starts to wonder if it's really, really necessary. But I do think we will see the category will continue. But to your point, I think it's going to be the marketing message has to be a little simplified, not how many more buttons, and how many more features can we add to it right now? Well, and to that, to that end, um, another question that we have here is related to um, motivators for consumer purchases. And, you know, we looked at that. We do have, you know, we asked that question across all of these categories. And um, part of the reason we didn't include it specifically category by category is that um, there was a real consistency in folks' motiva motivations. And it was, you know, certainly there was the replacing something that's either outdated, broken, et cetera. Um, but then the new innovation, you know, new technology, new innovation, new features, you know, is the second bullet on this slide mentions um, right. was very, very high across the across the board. You know, people are looking for and they're enthusiastic about, you know, new um, new features and innovations on product. Um, 
the other thing that we did see in some, some more than others, but a desire to have, um, to change things out for color or for style or any kind of aesthetic that people are going for in their homes is they're really building that lifestyle over the last few years right. um, of being in their home. Just a couple more here um, before we move on to dining and entertaining. Um, these are pretty easy, Peter. One is, uh, do knife sharpeners show up in the cutlery category? And I don't think we uh, did knife sharpeners specifically. We did not do knife sharpeners specifics. I can't give you any, uh, uh, data from the cons from this consumer outlook. I can tell you anecdotally that knife sharp the, with, with the preference for forged blades that is at fifty percent will come a, uh, a a recognition or or a demand for knife sharpeners. Uh, uh, and we have seen uh, the knife sharpener business grow commensurately, especially in better channels uh, in the last several years. As consumers have made the investment in better cutlery, they're taking better care of that cutlery, uh, and they want to learn how to do that at home. That's always been a bit of a drawback. New generation knife sharpeners tend to make it easier, a little more foolproof, but consumers need to understand and want to understand how do they take care of their better cutlery. So yes, I don't have a number to attach here, but I can tell you that knife sharpeners uh, grow, is going to be a high demand product going forward as consumers buy more um, better quality cutlery. Okay. And then last but not least, um, on the uh, coatings for cookware, did we ask if they would prefer a ceramic coating versus I, a traditional? I think we have that in there. I have to look for it. Um, I don't have that on the, off the top of my head. Uh, there, is a, a, there is a continuing awareness in general for um, uh, ceramic coated cookers. They do, there is a, there, there is a this is a, um, a segment of the market that continues strong in the United States. It has not, you know, completely overwhelmed the traditional fluoropolymer nonstick that continues to be high out there. Uh, who, I can, if someone wants to email uh, me or you, uh, I can actually uh, get them, uh, that information or when we share the link to the survey later on they can look into the cookware category to take a look at that specifically uh, an interesting one that just came in and then i'm going to move us along um, as it relates to cookware is there a specific month the consumers shop for this category i actually would um i would direct that question back to another report that we did that we actually have not done a webinar on peter which is the occasions report that we released right. earlier this year um, and what that report does is it identifies all of the different life events um, you know weddings and and childbirth and all these different um you know new houses new pets that tend to um, drive new purchases of housewares, either for a friend, either for gifting or for the self. And we did ask what types of products people would buy for themselves or for friends and family for each one of those occasions. And then we did ask the question about the seasonality of those occasions. So um, again, happy to take an email inquiry specifically around that, uh, Marion. And we, um, you know, happy to get back to you on that information, but there is a, an occasions report on homepage news that may also get you some of what you're looking for. Right. All right, so let's move into, oh, I'm sorry, one more thing before we go, my apologies. Um, going back to the Market Watch report and kind of this idea of the demand for uh, per the purchase intent here coming up, um, is this idea of rental. Um, and this stems from, and I'll try and make a long story short, but as we were doing Market Watch, uh, we realized that the number of people, especially, you know, in kind of the creative mindset, who really like to change the decor, the look, the style, the feel of their home over and over and over again throughout the year. You saw in kitchen textile slide. Um, but it really ran across, again, more to come on this related to the actual Market Watch report publication. Um, but people overwhelmingly want to change the look and feel of their home far more often than they are, than is convenient for them to do so or financially feasible. So with that in mind, we went out and we asked folks if they would be interested in renting any of these products. And what's interesting here is that when the data first came back, you see the darker lines up there, you know, everything was below 25% in terms of interest in renting. And so we immediately kind of said, oh, okay, nobody, people aren't going for that. That's not going to be a thing. But then we pulled, again, pulled millennials out and took a look at them and their inclination or interest in renting some of these things. A lot of these categories we just talked about, um, whether it's kitchen electrics or cookware or bakeware um, is extremely high compared to the average adult. Again, it's all under 50 percent um, but there is kind of this inclination and this you know this feeling that people might want to bring these things into their home on a more limited time basis and then trade them out as they get more fluid about the lifestyle and the look and feel of the home that they're creating 
Yeah, and, and, a, and kind of a, a, a tangent to that, uh, refurbished products, especially in kitchen electrics, um, you know, the idea of recycling and reusing products across the board is something that shows up in research as being uh, of interest to this consumer base. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to go out and put their home with all used uh, kitchenware, but it's important to understand the types of mindsets that you're trying to to, uh, to reach. The new product is, is, is what, what, what a lot of this is all about and getting them to buy it, but they're, they're exploring options more than they ever did before. Okay, for real, we're gonna move into dining and entertaining this time. Um, so what, one stat I wanted to pull out again from the Market Watch report, and this is about the connected consumer, which is somebody who's very, very excited about all of us coming back together again. Um, but we asked questions about people's expectations, their experience in 2021 and their expectations for 22 related to how they're gathering. And certainly, you know, the big news here, which is no surprise to anyone, is that, you know, the notion of all virtual type events, whether it's happy hours or, you know, um, memorials, anything like that, you know, are going to go down as we would expect fact in favor of certainly small group and large group coming back. So dining and entertaining, you know, with, you know, outside of just the core family unit is absolutely coming back. I think we all saw it over the holidays, even with the Omicron surge, there was significant regathering of people. So these next four categories we're going to talk about, glassware, drinkware, dinnerware, and flatware, all relate back to that. And again, because I get excited when I look at these things from a generational standpoint, in this, in dining and entertaining, where home cooking had a very strong millennial bend, dining and entertaining has an overwhelming millennial bend with a strong Gen Z bend behind it. So if you look here, the top lines here are the all adults. The second is millennials, which tend to outperform all adults by about 20% across the board in purchase intent. And Gen Z tends to outperform the average adult by about 10% across the board. So what that means with both of those generations really, really pulling forward, what you can extrapolate from that, the data backs it up, is that the baby boomer and Gen Z generations are not really prone for the, their, their purchase intent is significantly lower, you know, to make that average out the way it does. So as, uh, as our, you know, companies in these spaces are looking at their opportunities in the next year, I would say that, you know, millennials are a home run and Gen Z's at least a triple. <laughs> Let's start with glassware and just backing up a little bit. One of the common themes across tabletop, I think, is uh, it's an industry that for the last several years is trying to really reposition itself, the move away from formal wear to a, to a casual uh, uh, environment in, in, in the tableware business. And frankly, it's been a very challenging move. I think the pandemic, this is one of those categories where the pandemic uh, kind of reconnected the consumer with their their tableware, uh, both as a function, again, as a functional need, as they're having more meals, but also it's one of those areas where it's personally expressive. It's, it, it is a fashion driven business. And as we moved into a, a, I think a higher level of in-home entertaining this holiday season coming forth, you'll see people sort of reintroducing uh, family and friends to their home all over again and using tableware uh, as a, a primary wear, way to kind of showcase. That said, we start in glassware, I look at the two uh, number one categories that are tied at 49%, coffee and tea. Coffee and tea across all segments of the home and house for his business, from glassware to accessories to electric coffee makers remains an, uh, a, a, a central component of the business. Same in glassware, uh, whether it's uh, specialized coffee products, specialized tea products, the consumer's drinking more coffee and tea at home, they want new glassware for that. That said, tumblers, it's the um, most versatile piece of glassware in the kitchen. Uh, and it, it doesn't surprise me that it's going to be a high preference category. That said, we've heard a lot about specialty beer glasses, specialty wines, specialty whiskey and specialty cocktail. Those are important segments as we move into the dining, uh, to the entertaining season. Again, um, much more action around those in recent years and we'll continue to see that. Uh, when we look at configurations, uh, the set of four is still a very, very strong preference. The industry 
delivers a lot of product that way and the consumer gets that. But open stock is it's not equally important, but it is very important. So you're seeing consumers kind of mix and match again in the glassware business. They may get a set of four, but they're surrounding it with unique items and items that fit their needs, whether it's you know coffee, tea, or, or spirits and cocktails. Uh, quickly on key attributes, durability, number one. Clarity, number, oh, actually shape is number one, too. Uh, so people are using the glassware um, uh, uh, more often. They want, they don't want it to break. Dishwasher safe. Uh, all those things are going to be important. They want it to be clean and clear, and they want it to be a heavyweight. So they do want higher quality uh, glassware. They understand that it is generally a fragile business, but this industry has actually done a nice job of making the category more durable going forward. Color. Uh, still important, but not as important by far as clear. Clear is the most versatile thing. The consumer is telling us that, but they will accent their clear glassware with color where it fits. Uh, one question came up here, Peter, related to supermarkets um, and whether or not, because we don't have any key retail channels listed on this slide. And the reason for that is there really weren't any standouts. Um, the department store and discount stores that kind of rule the roost across the board were really the ones that jumped out here. So, um, you know, certainly there are there are some folks who will shop for this at the supermarket, um, but it's not, it doesn't jump out the way it does. I, in some of the I other don't, categories. yeah, I think this is one of those categories where supermarkets have uh, an opportunity on a seasonal basis and a promotional basis in the glassware business. Some of them are doing a better job on a day-to-day -day business. Um, uh, it is a, uh, supermarkets are, are very demanding about the number of turns they're gonna get in any given category and, and the cost for, for that real estate. And this may be one of those categories that just doesn't show up strong in the consumer because the supermarket hasn't really shown them a lot of glassware. That said, seasonal glassware, holiday glassware, uh, and products along those lines, I think it's an opportunity for supermarkets. Actually, surprisingly, online showed pretty strong, over well over 15% in this, which is, which is interesting because you would think consumers might be a little afraid of having glassware shipped, but it just tells you how strong online is as a general uh, cha channel right now. Drinkware. So this is this is a little bit of a hybrid category. It's 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 not necessarily traditional tableware, but it encompasses things like on-the-go beverage wear, thermal beverage wear, um, hydration bottles, children's uh, drinkware, and indoor/outdoor uh, plastic drinkware. So it's a little all over the place. Uh, this is a category, like I alluded to earlier, supermarkets are going to do better in these businesses because A, it's not the traditional glass beverage where uh, there are products that can be promotional and seasonal, uh, and there's a connection between kind of, um, you know, hydration and, and thermal beverage wear with the types of things you're going to get at the supermarket. Um, this is a performance category, especially as it relates to the on-the-go beverage wear. Um, it's it, 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 listen. It was the ultimate giveaway for many years. When you go to a uh, you go to a golf tournament or you go to some sort of special event, it seems like um, promotional drinkware like this is. But the reality of this, consumers have high expectations in today's market for their on-the-go beverage wear, whether they're they're going on fit for fitness reasons, uh, taking it with their kids, uh, going out on a picnic, whatever it might be. They want it to be real easy to clean. They need it to be durable. They need it to be easy to carry. They expect long lasting hot and cold performance and important leak proof. These are all important uh, considerations. The most important thing we took away from this is when it comes to drinkware like this, on the go beverage wear, hydration and insulated beverage wear, they are multiple product households. 53% have three or more hydration bottles in their home. Uh, almost 50% have three or more insulated thermal beverage wear products in their home. Uh, there is a seemingly untapped potential to continue to deliver new products to households. Consumers want many uh, options in this. They want one for each of the members of the family and so forth. Yeah, and I'll I'll, I'll go ahead and, and shamelessly um, steal from my uh, our, our dear friend Joe Dierotowski, um, who uh, who said who was talking about on the go beverage wear with me the other day. That's what we chat about. Um, and mentioned that, you know, as we, as things reopen here, as they are, as people are going back to the office, as kids are going back to soccer practice, as, you know, there's all of these activities that are coming back into light as people go back outdoors to, you know, to exercise or go back to the gym, um, that all of these on the go uh, drinkware, you know, just becomes more and more prevalent. Um, and there's more and more um, opportunity there to, uh, to sell multiple per person per household. 
dinnerware, a staple of the tabletop business. Again, a category that I think has had a bit of a, um, a renaissance the last couple of years and should continue going forward. Um, we, we looked at things a little differently when it came to the tabletop business where we focused on trend and we focused on style. These are still fashion categories and they, those, those fashion elements and those style elements are primary drivers. What I found was interesting here when we look at some of the um, uh, style factors here, uh, it's across the board. Uh, modern and contemporary is still very strong, but we see solid color, single or solid color strong. Plain white, white is always in. Um, if you have white dinnerware, just keep it around. It's gonna be uh, real popular again in a couple of years. It never goes away. Uh, going through that list, mix and match. I like to zero in on mix and match. Again, the consumer here is, uh, they're interested in sets. 45% say they will buy sets, but they're actually more interested in, in maybe smaller sets where they can mix in open stock purchases that might be uh, functionally specific or decoratively specific. They want to mix and match and create their own table setting, if they will, out of all of this variety. Um, Peter, the um, the mix and match pattern uh, is actually um, very predominantly in in the you know the numbers there um, is predominantly millennial, as as you right. might expect. Um, but even uh, the other thing about it, it is uh, the boomer generation is at like a two percent on that. They don't want anything to do with that mix and match pattern. They're looking for something that's kind of much more, I think, standard and off the shelf. Um, and interestingly enough, on the configuration, when you get into sets. Um, the, uh, the standout there, the people who really want to buy sets is Gen X, which yeah. I'm, not, I'm not even sure, you know, and I am Gen X, so I'm not entirely sure that I know how to explain that, but, um, but that seems to be right in that middle between the, you know, the boomers who, you know, are no way on some of the mix and match and the, you know, the millennials who are a little more attuned to that. Yep. Yep. Nothing surprising with regard to material. Stoneware is, is still strong. The fact that glass shows up uh, a little bit surprising to us. There aren't as many glass offerings in the marketplace, but there are glass offerings. And maybe this is an opportunity that's a little untapped. Uh, and porcelain, uh, a standard uh, material in this business, continues to be um, uh, popular among the consumers. Home specialty, supermarket, another, you know, for years, supermarkets have, have had continuity business in uh uh, the dinner or category. So the, the, the category itself is not necessarily new to that channel. I do think, again, you're seeing uh, supermarkets gravitate toward better product, more, uh, more seasonal uh, offerings in that category, uh, not necessarily your traditional big set configurations in that business. Flatware. Uh, again, we're, we're going to see some of the same trends we've seen in some of the other tabletop categories here. Uh, this one was interesting. Uh, when we look at styles, classical and traditional flatware at 39%, modern and contemporary at 33%. So it's close, but classical and traditional is still a, 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 a strong preference. I think it's seen as more durable from a, from a lifestyle standpoint. Uh, it's the kind of thing you're going to make an investment in and expect to hold on to it for a while. So you're looking for product that not necessarily is ornate per se, but is uh, maybe a bit more tr a transitional from a style standpoint. But the consumer sees classic and traditional as being strong. Yet there is a, 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 le a leaning in many segments of the market for modern and contemporary. Um, set configuration. Uh, 20 piece sets, yeah, still a decent size market for that. Uh, 45 piece sets uh, in certain channels like warehouse clubs and others, uh, you're going to see bigger set, set counts. Um, I like to look at the five piece place setting as an opportunity, not just in the luxury business, but in the everyday business. And open stock, once again, open stock um, is going to be there for consumers who want a little bit more variety in their, their flatware or are looking to accent their, their court um, flatware with, with unique items, especially for, for entertaining and things like that. Uh, not so much surprising from a finish standpoint, high polish. Um, is 24% of the market in terms of preference. Matte and satin, 17 and 12%. High polish is, uh, especially if it's dishwasher safe, uh, is still seen as a cleaner 
more elegant uh, solution to many consumers, although there is a market for the matte and satins as well. And I think, uh, Leon, I don't know if there was any other uh, demographic breakdowns here that sort of stood out to you or no? Well, no, and almost what stood out to me was the fact that there wasn't. Um, you know, I would have expected the configurations to, you know, to break down by generations in an interesting way, but really they were completely consistent across the board. So uh, no preference for those configurations, uh, whether you're Gen Z, uh, Gen X, Baby Boomer, Millennial, all, all, this, all really the same. So as we wrap up dining and entertaining, we look at some of the key takeaways. Um, smaller set counts, open stock, and mix and match tabletop collectively are helping to encourage the personal touch for consumers. This is a category where you can really personally express yourself. It's a fashion statement. It's a style statement. It's a status statement, especially as we move into the entertaining segment, where again, people are reintroducing their homes to their friends and family all over again. And they want people to interact with these products and feel like there's something special about them. I did the contemporary versus traditional breakout. It was more evident in the um, uh, flatware business, but I think there is often this feeling that you want to lean toward contemporary or lean toward traditional. I think you need a blend. Traditional is far more important than, than you might think it is still, because I think it's seen as durable and enduring. Uh, so a balance is probably going to be the, the right mix for many retail segments. Uh, Big thirst for on-the-go drinkware, performance and versatility. It, it, people are, are concerned and very aware of what they want and need from their on-the-go beverage where they expect it to be high quality, they expect it to last, and they expect it to work. Coffee and tea growth is still brewing across segments, whether it's glassware, kitchen accessories. In, in the dining and entertainment segment, uh, again, I think coffee and tea are important categories. It's not just about breakfast at home. This is a category that, that is going to be important throughout the day. And Liana, I'll kick it back to you on the generational stuff. Yeah, I just to just to kind of tie a bow on it from where we started, um, the millennial and Gen Z, you know, once again on this one, uh, represent significantly higher purchase intent. Millennials by nearly twenty percent, and Gen Z by nearly ten percent versus the average adult, which again, conversely, um, really, really drags down the Gen X and Baby Boomers' purchase intent related to dining entertainment. So I really think the the focus is very, very clear here. Um, we do have a number of questions, a couple of them, then I'll just address off the bat. Um, were price points part of the survey? They were. And if you go to, I'm going to go ahead and put us on our last slide here. Um, if you go to homepagenews.com slash outlook hyphen 2022, um, all of the charts that we've shown today, plus a wealth of other charts by category are all available. We did ask about price points what people expected to pay. Um, they are by macro category, not subcategory. So kitchen electrics, um, not necessarily air fryer versus toaster, et cetera, but there are price points on there. What's important is we're giving you highlights today the depth of the information on the report, this is to kind of give you a little bit of an appetizer. There, we ask very specific questions about specific things within each category. So if we didn't talk about it today, there's a good chance we have uh, some of that detail in the report. And if not, get in touch with us. We can go into the report and look for things that we may not have necessarily published. Yeah, exactly. We have a lot of cross tabs that we can dig through. Um, Question related to the kind of explosion in wine and beer and, you know, saying that the kitchen tools and gadgets numbers don't necessarily look like they um, benefited necessarily as much from all of the sales of wine and spirit. Um, question related to, you know, do you see categories where that is reflected and perhaps in the glassware where we saw some of those specialty, you know, beer, wine, martini glasses. Um, but I would also say, and, and this kind of jumps into, you know, a couple of different things that folks have asked, which is that because this is kind of our first time out of the gate on this report, um, what's really exciting is that next year, this will serve as a benchmark by which we can then identify where some of those growth and some of those drop-offs have taken place. So right now we're just kind of in benchmarking mode, um, but as we move forward, we'll be able to give added intelligence around where things are, are dropping off and, and increasing. Yeah, I think, although you would expect if there's if, if, if wine and spirit uh, 
ranks high in the glassware's business. It would have ranked high in, in some of the other segments. I think you know it, we, we this was not these were not open ended questions. We had, we aided the consumer and we we fed them uh, a number of categories within each general category. And I think at some point they were making they're making choices about their preferences. Uh, although I still you still do see. You see commensurate in baking in terms of accessories and, and baking products uh, and, and related products. I do think there is a strong connection to the potential for wine and spirits that, that will cross categories, will cross kitchen tools and gadgets into the, into the tabletop business and accessories categories. So I think as Peter mentioned, you know, he and I are both happy to take inquiries um, via email um, related to any of the data here and, you know, asking specific questions about a category that, you know, you're involved in that you would like to know more about. I'm going to go ahead and, and throw my email address into the chat here um, so that everyone knows how to get a hold of me. And um, Peter, um, I can go ahead and put yours in there too. Yeah. Or actually, if you wouldn't mind, I don't know which one you want me to throw on there. You but. do homepage news, PG and Eddie at homepagenews.com. There was an earlier question up here that we didn't get to about uh, preference for silicone products versus wood glass steel is an environmental issue. People concerned uh, about yes. having natural items in the home. I think the answer to that question is yes. I mm -hmm. think there is a strong uh, awareness of and preference. I don't think it's as compelling necessarily a reason as some might think it is. Um, I, I think other functional elements are going to be important, whether it's durability, easier to clean, uh, uh, long lasting, all those things. But to answer your question, I do believe that you have to be concerned right now with the a consumer that is going to be persuaded by natural materials, perhaps more than they ever were. Uh, the, the gap between stainless steel and silicone was what was surprising to me. Yeah, I mean, I think, though, that from an aesthetic standpoint, certainly when you think about um, products that you're kind of storing in place right out in the open, when you think yeah. about cutting boards and you think about other you know, types of products, um, things that are, you know, th things that are wood, things that are glass, things that are steel, you know, they are kind of more natural in terms of their aesthetic. It's not even part of it is they actually they go very, very well with a number of the different kind of, you know, decor and lifestyle trends that are out there. But part of it is that, you know, if it's the kind of thing that you have to leave on the counter, <laughs> you're pouring away in a cupboard you know it still looks really nice yeah i, I think sometimes people we, we get trapped in kind of an all or nothing point of view when it comes to identifying what what is the the preferred aesthetic or preferred product or preferred material and what we're hoping to do with research like this is to show the ebbs and flows as as you go from year to year uh, it is not an all or nothing proposition it's 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 it illustrates or illuminates opportunities of, of how you need to highlight your product mix I think what is going to be evident as we go forward is the need to be flexible in terms of merchandising and product development and, need, and to not so much try to radically revolutionize the design or the material going forward, but to understand how consumers are responding to them and adjust your mix going forward. In general, consumers are far more interested and aware of material, uh, where materials come from and how they're, how they're processed than ever before. And we, we've talked about that in other uh, uh, sessions with the IHA in terms of the evolution of material advances in this business right now. All right, last one. Um, we've got Joe here asked if there's any questions related to social media preferences. We really didn't do um, kind of social media or media consumption. We did, however, ask a number of questions about where consumers research products that they're looking to, um, to purchase that they're in the market for. So all of that information is on, um, those charts are on the homepage news outlook. Uh, URL that's listed right here. You can see what those different, you know, word, you know, whether it's a personal recommendation for a friend, online reviews, product catalogs, etc. Um, I do need to wrap us up here as we are uh, just at the two o'clock mark. But to Peter's earlier point, um, we are doing a part two, which will be health, comfort, and beauty, and clean living. Personal care and wellness is part of health, comfort, and beauty. Everyone here will, um, first of all, we will post the session. It's recorded. We will be posting it in the next week, and everybody who signed up for this session will receive a follow-up email that includes a registration link to next week's session where we cover the other two categories. So thanks to everyone for um, participating and we hope to see you next week. Thanks everyone. Take care.